I'm Professor Tom McGuire, Director of the Air Force Humanities Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 11th annual David L. Janetta Distinguished Lecture Series in War, Literature, and the Arts. I'd like to begin the evening by thanking our sponsor, Mr. David Janetta, from the class of 75, and the USAFA Endowment for making this lecture possible. I'd also like to acknowledge our distinguished guest, Brigadier General Armacost, the Dean of the Faculty, General Armacost's wife, Kathy, General Armacost's wife, Kathy, is also with us. <laughs> Colonel Packard, the Vice Dean of the Faculty. <laughs> Colonel Harrington, permanent, permanent Professor and Head of the Department of English and Fine Arts. And Colonel Harrington's mother, Barbara, is also here with us. We also welcome all per permanent professors, department heads, and other special guests in attendance. Now please join me in welcoming to the stage a true champion of the humanities, our benefactor, Mr. Janetta, who will introduce our guest speaker. Please give him a warm welcome. Good evening. It's a real pleasure to be back, and I have to say I've never heard a dean get such a rousing report. <laughs> I was wondering what would happen if the commandant was here and uh, have, the, have the applause meter. <clears throat> never mind, I didn't, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> As I always do before I come out for the lecture, I sift through the old file of my academy years that now is from the last century, obviously, and I found uh, a, a little bit that reminded me that when I was here, I had a very, very powerful position. I was the wing activities officer. Now, don't laugh. The reason that that was a powerful position was because I was the guy that got up at lunchtime and at, at the evening meal and did the wing attend hut. Is, is, the, is the current wing attend hut cadet here, perchance? No. Okay, well you know who it is. <laughs> and why is it powerful? It's powerful because every day I would come into Mitchell Hall and up in the mezzanine level look out, hear the boisterous crowd as everybody was coming in, and then I would say those, those, those three very important words, wing attend hut. I think that's three, it could be two, but we'll let Colonel Harrington decide that later. Um, but I would say those three words and all of a sudden silence would descend upon the Mitchell Hall and everybody would stand up straight and, and come to attention. It was a real feeling of power, those three words. And I often thought, gee, maybe it would be cool to say something like, uh, you know, and tours will be eliminated for the rest of the year and, and then say just for fun. And, and then I realized that probably wouldn't do much for the longevity of, of my cadet career. But uh, those three words uh, stuck with me and, and how important they were. Need your ID. Need your ID. Those three words are very important. And if, well, for those of you who have read Girl at War, understand what those words mean. And to Anna, the protagonist in the novel, her parents knew exactly how important those words were. Anna wasn't, wasn't aware of, of what that soldier at that checkpoint was asking for, but her parents knew. Need your ID, and they knew that by presenting that soldier with their identification card, that soldier would know something very important, probably the most important thing that would determine their fate. He would know their name. Now, the soldier was Serbian. Anna's family 
were Croatian. Now, you couldn't look at the two and tell, well, this one's Serbian and this one is, is, is Croatian, obviously, because of the way they looked, because they looked the same. You couldn't listen to the way they spoke to each other and find out whether they were Serbian or Croatian because they sounded the same. The only way that they could tell the difference was in the last name. And as soon as Anna's parents handed that officer uh, their identification cards, they knew their, their fate was sealed. Back in uh, 1999, I was still flying with the 193rd Special Operations Wing, a, a, uh, an Air National Guard group in uh, Pennsylvania, and we were deployed. I was a navigator on, on the EC-130. We were deployed um, in a NATO operation. It was Operation uh, uh, Allied Force. And the purpose of the operation was to get, uh, somehow to find a way to uh, get peace in Kosovo. And in 99, we flew, pro well, not, not we, but everybody flew about three months of bombing missions and other operations. And uh, finally, there was an agreement struck and Yugoslav forces left Kosovo and the UN peacekeepers came in and uh, 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 tried, to, tried to keep the ethnic cleansing from uh, reoccurring. Um, the, um, when I came back, I thought, well, gee, you know, now that we're in the 20th or now that we're in the 21st century, maybe the 20th century ethnic cleansing uh, efforts, which were really driven by nationalist forces, would fade away. But here we are in 2017 in the United States of America, and what do we hear? We hear, we hear uh, deport the deplorables. Jews will not replace us. B build the wall. Blood and soil. Immigrants not welcome. You know, show me your ID. The study of humanities is vitally important here at the academy so that we can try to figure out a way for our future, your future more importantly than mine, to overcome all of these efforts that we've seen in the past. And that's why I'm so proud to be the sponsor of this lecture and proud to, and pleased to introduce Sarah today. Sarah is the assistant professor of creating creative writing at Stockton uh, University in New Jersey, and she's also the editor of uh, Blunderbuss Magazine, a fiction magazine. Please join me in giving uh, Sarah Novick a warm, warm cadet welcome. Sarah? Thank you, guys. Well, goodbye. <laughs> No, um, thanks so much for having me here tonight, especially thanks to Mr. Janetta and all the humanities faculty and um, everybody who made it possible for me to be here. It's an honor to spend these few days with you. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit tonight about why I think reading and writing matter for you and for all humans. Um, my own students ask me this all the time. What's the deal? Why are you making me read all these books, writing all of these essays? And I understand the impulse. Um, I was a student who was fine at, but really hated math. Um, and so I was always the first one to raise my hand in class and kind of whine, like, but when are we gonna use this in real life? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but for me, um, when people ask me that question about literature, uh, the answer is easy because writing kind of saved me. Um, as a kid, I was weird. Um, maybe you're not surprised we writers have a reputation <laughs> for that. Um, but I was really weird, and I didn't make it very far into first grade before the teacher called my mom in for a conference. I was so painfully shy that she was sure there was something wrong with me and thought that I should be evaluated. Um, happy to report that the official diagnosis is nerd, um, so all good, but um, anyway, luckily my mom had other plans. 
uh, she bought me a notebook. It was blue, and it had ballerinas on it, and she commanded me that um, I should start a journal. And uh, every day I had to sit at the table, and I wasn't allowed to get up until I filled a page of this notebook. And I hated it so much. Um, I was a huge tomboy. I hated the ballerinas. They angered me just looking at them. I hated having to sit at the table because I wanted to be outside. I hated the whole idea of the journal and writing about my feelings, which I thought was girly and therefore terrible. Um, so every day for a long time, I would write in really big letters so that it filled up most of the page, this journal is so stupid. And that would be like the whole entry. For, for a long time. <laughs> um, but after a while, something happened. And I can't really pinpoint the moment, but slowly I began to write a little bit more about whatever happened at school or a question I had, um, something I was trying to figure out. Still, I'd write at the end some kind of bravado-filled line about how this was dumb or some just in case. But um, secretly, I, I really liked it. It gave me a space to think, to puzzle out questions I was too embarrassed to ask anyone, um, to feel afraid or sad or pissed off um, without some grown-up declaring that I needed my head examined. Reading, too, was a safe place for me. I always read everything I could get my hands on, and in my house, um, we had way more CDs than books, so I read a lot of liner notes, a huge store of music lyrics in my head still today, which is super useless. Uh, <laughs> even when I felt weird or isolated from my peers or when I couldn't sleep, I knew I could find a friend or a few moments peace in a novel. And later, when I was kind of at the end of elementary school, I started to lose my hearing. So books became even more important to me because before I learned sign language or how to lip read, the words on the page were the only thing I could understand. So without written language as a constant tool for self-expression and communication, I really don't know what would have happened to me. But I don't think I would be here. <laughs> um, maybe you guys, growing up as budding scientists or mathematicians or engineers, um, reading and writing were not your things. Uh, but that doesn't mean they won't be useful to you in the future. I can promise you that no matter where you go from here, you're about to see and do things that you've never seen or done before, and you might need a blank space to think, to write down questions you don't want to ask anyone because you're embarrassed, to feel afraid or sad or pissed off. Um, novels, too, might be the sidekick you never knew you needed. Think about it. They are highly portable. They don't need batteries. When you leave here, you'll probably find yourself far from home, maybe somewhere uncomfortable, too hot or too cold, or totally claustrophobic or lonely. And books can be a lifeline back to a familiar place or a zip line out into an unknown place, whether that be a total fantasy world or a place like Croatia 1990, before Game of Thrones and cruise ships made it cool before the US or the UN intervened, before we even made the news. I kept writing in my journal through high school and I got good grades in English class, but I still consider myself kind of a reluctant writer, maybe an accidental one. I knew the written word had power and that it calmed me and carried me when I was upset. Um, and like Anna, my father was a storyteller. He kind of used to make up stories. Um, bedtime stories or just random stories as a way to teach us things or just to make us laugh. But still, I was the first person in my family to go to college, so I kind of went out expecting I'm going to study something and I'm going to get a real job and it's all going to be very practical. Um, it also never really occurred to me that writing was something that people did out in the open. I don't know actually where I thought books came from. <laughs> this is, so, uh, I, I don't know, I was a little slow on the uptake, I guess. But anyway, it didn't occur to me that writing could be a career, for sure. Um, then after high school, when I moved to Croatia, 
uh, to be with my family, I saw my first glimpse of the importance of telling stories and specifically telling war stories. The people who had survived the war there needed to talk about it. They wanted people to know what had happened to them. And they were particularly open with me, I think because I was kind of a middle person, somebody who spoke Croatian and understood, but also was markedly American. Um, they told me about their experiences and I wrote them all down in my journals. Um, and then I didn't know what would come of that. Uh, later I came back to the States for college and I accidentally took a creative writing class. Uh, it was a scheduling mistake and uh, a teacher changed at the last minute, I think. Um, so I ended up in this class, I had no idea what to do, uh, and ended up writing a story about the war in Croatia and it was the very first iteration of the characters and some of the storyline in Girl at War, a short little thing. Um, my mode had changed from writing in my journal to writing fiction, but my motivation hadn't. I wrote be still because I was pissed. Um, I was mad that my friends and family had suffered and that good people, smart people, people who read a lot of books here in the States still didn't know. Um, they hadn't heard of this war or maybe even couldn't find Croatia on a map. So I handed in the story. My professor called me into his office. I was so scared. <laughs> he said, this is really good. Is it personal to you? And I said, well, yeah. He said, you should turn it into a novel. I was like 18 at this point. I don't think I said anything back to him, uh, but I know I looked at him like, yeah, right, okay, buddy, I'll write a novel, sure. Um, and he, he just said, you're gonna write this novel and you're not gonna pull any punches. And so I went back to my dorm and looked up what pull any punches means. <laughs> and then um, I just kept writing. But still, I had a lot to learn about writing and about the war. So I wanted to read you one of the parts of the book um, that obviously if you've read the book you'll recognize, but if not, um, I, I'll, you know, you'll hear it now. So, so um, I wrote, I wrote it really early on, and the reason that I want to share it with you was because initially I thought it was going to be the climax of the book. Um, it's like a big action scene. It's angry, of course. That's my jam. Um, and it's, it's a turning point for a lot of the characters. So basically what's going on for those who haven't read um, at this point in the book, Anna, the protagonist, is 10 years old, and she's kind of lost in rural Croatia without her family. She's taken in by a family, and their son's name is Damir, so you'll see him come up. And then Damir brings her with him to the safe house, which is this just house where a militia has formed. Um, and they're a group trying to defend the town against Serbian militias, who are called the Chetniks, and the Yana'a, who is the Yugoslav National Army, which was headed and controlled by Serbia, too. So. The safe house had once been just a regular house, though no one ever spoke of whose it was or what had happened to them. Inside, my eyes watered. The rooms were dim, shutters drawn, and the whole place was cloaked in a nicotine haze. Damir was talking to the front door guards, and I hung as close to him as I could without being a nuisance, studying the house as my vision cleared. On the walls were pictures of well-oiled, topless women, and the deep-browed, prominent nose face even I recognized as General Ante Gotovina, whose likeness was fast becoming the logo of the Croatian resistance. Ultra-nationalist slogans were spray-painted on every smooth surface. Walls, doors, countertops, zadom spremni for the home, ready. The furniture was smashed, save for one red leather chair in the middle of the kitchen, which no one ever sat in. Gotovina's chair, we called it. I followed Damir up the stairs to the top floor, a single large room that seemed inexplicably bright until I realized a chunk of the roof was missing. Wait here, he said, and I got nervous. I watched Damir approach an ancient man with glasses so thick the lenses protruded from their frames. He 
They spoke in low voices while I stood in the doorway. Despite the winter chill, just as noticeable inside because of the missing roof, the man wore only jeans and a sleeveless undershirt that revealed dry, scabbed arms. The man looked over at me as Damir talked, then raised a hand in my direction and motioned for me to come. I heard his knees crunch as he bent down to my eye level. What's your name there, he said. She uh, doesn't talk, Damir said. Well, never mind that. We're not looking for speech makers. We need workers, and I can see you're a tough guy. Behind the glasses, his eyes were magnified, round like an insect's, and I was doubtful about whether he could see anything at all. But I liked that he'd called me tough, and I smiled a little. He tugged on the brim of my hat. An adventurer, maybe? I didn't know what that had to do anything, but I wanted the captain to like me, so I nodded. He extended a knobby hand, and I tapped it in a hesitant high five. Okay, Indiana Jones it is. He pressed himself back into a standing position and put his hand on Damir's shoulder. Why don't you go set her up with Stallone? Yes, sir, Damir said, removing an AK from its spot on the hat rack before guiding me to the back of the room, away from the windows. The safe house was populated by leftovers. The elderly and teenaged, men too old to be drafted, and boys like Damir, technically too young to fight. The safe housers had replaced their given names with those of American action movie icons. The house contained two Bruces, a Lee and a Willis, Corleone, Bronson, Stake, Snake Plissken, Scarface, Van Damme, Leonardo, Donatello of the Turtles, not the painters, they were quick to assert, and several men from the, gen the next town over who answered to the general call of Wolverines. Though I didn't know about the movies to decode the system, the nicknames were usually assigned by vote and were somewhat indicative of rank. Damir, for his valor in an operation past, had been awarded the most coveted moniker, Rambo. I was the only girl there. In the corner, we found Stallone, a boy about my age, swathed in ammo belts and sporting an eye patch of indeterminate medical necessity. What's your name, he said. She's Indiana, Damir said. She'll be with you now. Indiana Jones? He seemed impressed. Where are you from? I looked up at Damir, but he had already gone. You don't talk? I shook my head. He raised his hands in a series of gestures synchronous with his speech. You deaf? I shook my head again. My brother's deaf, he said. He pointed to a gunner at the side window, the only person of regular military age in the house, the Terminator. The, the floor around Stallone was littered with bullets and cartridges. I cleared a place beside him and sat down. Okay, he said. This is how you do it. From then on, I reloaded magazines. My fingers were small and agile, perfect for filling the clips. I sat on the floor with Stallone amid piles of munitions, sorting and loading. The ammo, Stallone said, was smuggled in through Hungary or Romania or the Czech Republic, countries who knew what it meant to overthrow a government and were willing to ignore the EU embargo. Stallone also manned the CB radio, taking in strings of garbled code from the other safe house strongholds, across the region and alerting the captain of Yuna of plane sightings or Chetnik activity in the neighboring towns. Sometimes we picked up broadcasts from the Croatian police force and I took their coordinates and labeled them on a map on the back wall. When we caught their frequency, Stallone always sent an SOS to see if they were coming to get us, but we never heard back. Must be busy, Stallone would say, and readjust his eye patch. So I'll skip ahead a couple pages, but in the meantime, what happens is uh, Anna kind of gets the swing of things in the safe house, and also some girls show up. Um, they are mostly teenagers who are away on a recon mission. So, Sorted munitions made the safe house run smoother, but the older girls all had their own assault rifles, and I was getting restless. I had proven myself a good worker, I thought, and I wanted to fight like everybody else. The following week, during morning meetings, when weapons were issued to the new recruits from other villages, I lined up with the rest, tucked my hair up under my cap, and hoped the dirt on my face covered any traces of girlhood. The captain looked me up and down and said there was not enough for everyone. But the next day, we took on mortar fire that tore a new hole in the south wall. The captain made Stallone and me lie face down on the floor, and I loathed the familiar feeling of helplessness. I tried to lift my head, but could see only boots. Someone fell beside me, I couldn't tell who, and his weapon discharged as he hit the floor. 
A hollow, wobbling tone filled my ears, then a roaring sound like rushing water. The man was bleeding in spurts from his neck, and I closed my eyes again. Afterwards, I sat up and looked around. Stallone was beside me, pressing his sleeve to a slash across his forehead, saying something I couldn't hear. My ears were still ringing. I took the gun from the dead man next to me, a wolverine, and slipped its strap over my head. No one noticed. The strongest men heaved the corpses down the stairs and laid them out behind the house, waiting for nightfall so they could transport them to the cemetery at the far end of the village. At dusk, Stallone and I went out and counted Chetnik casualties. We kicked the bodies, searched their pockets for ammo. Damir taught me how to field strip and reassemble an AK. Forward grip, gas chamber, cleaning rod, bolt, piston first, frame, magazine, function check. It meant to cock the gun as a test, the last step in reassembly, but anyone completing the check just yelled it triumphantly, a battle cry preceding the first bursts of gunfire. The field strip was a protocol that never changed, and I found solace in the repetition. The old men let me keep watch while they were eating lunch. Too short to shoot with my feet on the ground, I'd climb up and kneel in the windowsill. I shot over toward the schoolhouse at anything moving in the windows or outside ground level on the other side of the street. Jumped down and ducked in case a Chetnik was clear-headed enough to shoot straight back. With every round, I envisioned killing the soldier with the brown teeth, the one who'd struck my father in the back of the knee and laughed. I relished the power that seemed to run through the chamber of the weapon directly into my own veins. Occupation under the Chetniks was a delicate balance. In their state of perpetual intoxication, they'd been satisfied in rape and pillage mode, their genocidal appetites satiated by picking off safe housers and the occasional roadside murder of travelers like my parents. The danger of killing too many of us and losing their UN meal tickets staved off any large-scale assaults. But the Yuna uh, closing in on the area sent reinforcements, and the reinforcements were not yet weary of the place. They had salaries, uniforms, better weapons, and a functioning chain of command. Relatively, they were sober. I was in the attic window keeping watch with the Terminator when we spotted a band of armored vehicles. About 10, it looked like. The trucks were green, not UN issue, and when I looked up at the Terminator, he was gesturing frantically. I bolted across the attic to get Stallone, who, upon seeing his brother's sign, yelled, holy shit, the Yuna, uh, they're coming down the street. The trucks were closer now, and I could see the red Yugoslavian stars on their doors. Let's move, said the captain, and everyone who'd been without a gun lunged for the extras on the hat rack. I turned for his next instructions, but from downstairs we heard gunfire, the blowback of broken glass, and the door guards screaming. They're here, said Stallone. We ran down the uneven rear stairs and out the back door, through the packed dirt alley by the market and out into the fields. The stalks of wheat bowed with rotting grain-laden heads abandoned by farmers when the bombing started, but even in their hunched posture, they were taller than I was, and I could see nothing but wheat in all directions. I wondered where Stallone had gone. Then from a side row, I saw Damir darting toward me. You've got speed, girl, he said when he caught up. He grabbed me by the hood of my sweatshirt and yanked me to the left, hard. No sense of direction, though. The butt of my rifle banged a bruise into the back of my leg as we ran. A pack of Yuna of foot soldiers was coming from the other side of the field now. There were at least 20 of them, and I froze, gaping, as they closed the meters between us, 100, 75, 50. But Damir pushed me ahead of him and released a spray of gunfire. In the corner of my vision, I saw him go down, but he yelled, don't stop, so I kept running, made a sharp turn into the field's middle strip. The wind hit my face, fresh and hard. My nose dripped and my eyes watered. Dragging my sleeve across my face, I pumped my legs faster until I could no longer feel the ground, until gravity slithered off the treads of my sneakers. At the center of the field, I threw myself beneath a tractor and curled into a compact ball. There was gunfire and yelling from every angle, and I tried to listen for voices I know. I thought of Damir and waited for the familiar sadness to set in, but found only anger in its place. With one hand, I felt the ground for my AK and was relieved to find it there beside me. So maybe you can see why I thought this might be the crux of the book. Um, it's one of the more explicit moments of combat, first of all. Um, and it's important 
point for char Anna's uh, character development. And it's a moment where after the huge trauma of losing her parents, she gets back a little of her agency. Um, she has a community of soldiers and a weapon and she feels the power in that. And there is power in that. But still, it's not the center of the novel. It's not the moment that makes Anna whole again. And Anna knowing the field strip procedure is not what makes you care about her. Uh, for Anna and for real soldiers and civilians, the work begins after the smoke clears and after the homecoming. I flew here yesterday uh, on September 11th. It was really strange. Um, all the airports were covered in banners that said never forget. But I don't think forgetting is really the problem. I'll never forget that day, the moment that I found out what happened. I was a ninth grader in chemistry class. I remember the lab table. I remember the look on my teacher's face. Um, I doubt most people who are old enough can forget such a thing. To remember is easy, and the facts are readily retrievable even if you don't remember them. Um, but it's what we do with that memory that's important. So this is another task of literature and of art, to bear witness. Looking at the example of the former Yugoslavia, it's easy to see why stories of war are necessary. It's still a time of reconciliation there, of developing new governments and infrastructures. Parts of Croatia and Bosnia are still being demined from the cluster bombs that were used. Um, and they say probably that will take until 2020. So this is really essential work, obviously, life-saving work. Um, but there's a parallel question running alongside the physical reconstruction. What do we put in the history books? How did this happen? Who's responsible? And the way that the war is documented and taught to the current generation is the single most important factor determining whether or not genocide will happen again there. So knowing the facts and figures are important, but when it comes to decision making, the power of influence uh, of, of those facts pales in comparison to emotion. I'm willing to bet that some disciplines consider this a negative thing, uh, that they might try to override this tendency with training and preparedness measures. But I say our emotions and our capacity to think beyond the bounds of any plan are a good thing. That's what makes us people, and we can use that to our advantage if we're aware of it. So this means your stories too. I um, teach at a writing workshop for veterans and I'm sure that you guys already know that currently less than 1% of the American population is, is serving in the military and it's been that way for a long time. Um, that means millions of people here have no close family or friends serving. They don't feel the human cost of war at all and that's very dangerous. Um, so writing by service people and veterans can change that. It can make them understand not on a political scale, but from one human with arms and legs and feelings to another. And finally, if your writing process is anything like mine, writing is really great and important practice at being wrong. Girl at War took me over five years to write. Um, and I write by hand, so I'm really extra slow. Um, it's like a lot of writing, crossing out, rewriting, then typing it up, deleting, retyping. The whole second section of this book, I cut out and rewrote multiple times. Uh, Brian, I cut him out and put him back in and cut him out, and there were some other people in there who were not Brian, who were not there anymore. I constantly played with the novel's timeline. I always knew that it needed to move back and forth in time, but I tried a lot of different things that were really bad. Um, I wrote a draft that started in the present day and jumped back in time, and that was awful because readers were justifiably so, like, why is Anna so grumpy? What's wrong with her? Um, <laughs> and I, I also wrote a draft where I went back and forth every other chapter from past to present, and that was super confusing. Um, so this is part of the job, and I think particularly in writing, 
one's aptitude for writing is kind of inversely proportional to the amount you fuck up while you're doing it. Um, no one makes more mistakes or revises more than published professional writers, right? So, but I think actually it's the same for you guys as leaders in your field, future leaders. Um, you must be the absolute best at being wrong. To serve your country is honorable, and no doubt your commitment comes from deep reserves of patriotism, tradition, love for everything that America stands for. But to love something or some place uh, can't mean that we br blindly and relentlessly insist on its perfection. There has to be space for revision for identifying and admitting mistakes, for reconfiguring, redesigning, regrouping. And you guys in charge have to have the eye for detail to pinpoint the problem and then the capacity um, to think creatively to fix it. It's no accident for me that Anna's father, a storyteller, saves her life on the edge of that grave by convincing her to play a game. Much of war, and certainly genocide, does not follow the rules. It's not rational. Quick thinking and creativity are so often the only chance for survival for so many people. But thinking creatively is a muscle. You have to stretch it, you have to build it up. To read and to imagine faraway places and fictitious characters is really good exercise. And empathy, too, requires creativity. It's really hard to see stuff from another person's point of view. It's hard for everyone, and it's even harder to imagine what they might be feeling. But fiction is in the business of helping us practice empathy because more than any other medium, it imitates the way we build relationships in real life. The reason we love someone, say your best friend, is not because of his or her physiological um, makeup or demographics, statistics, it's because of their favorite dumb joke and the way they sound when they laugh, or a shared memory of the time you got in trouble at the town pool, or your mutual love of Cool Ranch Doritos. <laughs> it's in the details. In the same way, despite being from an unfamiliar place, Anna becomes a three-dimensional person for you as readers because you know her innermost thoughts. Um, about books, about her boyfriend, and about everything that she's lost. Anna is not a real person, but that doesn't mean there's no truth to her. In reality, there are many Annas, people who have endured what she did, and worse, in the former Yugoslavia and all across the globe. It's happening right now, sure, as I stand before you. How important it is for you then as future leaders, not only to see suffering, but to feel it. To know the cost of war, not only quantitatively or as a series of goals in a mission in the abstract, but in your gut. Real pain, same as you feel. Real blood, same as you and your airmen bleed. There's a moment at the start of Girl at War where Anna's schoolmate's brother is killed and she sees her friend for the first time after the incident at the air raid shelter. Um, it's really tiny, so I'm just gonna read it to you quickly. I saw Tomislav underground during a raid two days later. The rest of us were shoving in line for the generator bike when he showed up. We stopped pushing and stared. The starkness in his eyes scared me much more than if he had been crying. The boy who was riding stopped without discussion Tomislav passed us and mounted the bike. For a moment, I watched him as he pedaled furiously, turning his pain into power, something tangible. Then we dissolved the line and moved to another corner of the shelter to give him some privacy, which seemed like the right thing to do, according to the code of wartime behavior we were making up as we went along. For me, this moment is a metaphor for the potential of literature in your lives, in my life, in, in everybody's lives, to create light out of darkness, something tangible from abstraction, pain into power. That's why we write and what we stand to gain. Thank you.
Have your seats, please. At this time, Mr. Janetta will present a token of our appreciation to Ms. Novich. Sarah, if we like the presentation by our guest speaker, we will, we, we like on behalf of the cadet wing present you with the bird. Now, obviously it's not just any bird, but it's the mascot of the Air Force Acad Academy. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great symbol, I think, for us to give to you uh, because it does represent the fierceness that, that I felt certainly in honest struggle and, and uh, in life throughout your work. So on behalf of the cadet wing, thank, thank you. you.